Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. We finished studying verse 42 of the second chapter of Acts, which is a synopsis or overview of the spiritual life of the primitive church. Along with those verses that teach on the baptism in the Holy Spirit, These are among the most important verses in the chapter because they lay out why the church operated in the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. Until we are willing to live like those first saints lived and have the faith that they had in Jesus and His promises, we won't see the results they saw. Though I thoroughly disagree theologically with those branches of the Christian church that reject the sound biblical teaching that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is for the church of today, I partially understand why they make that claim. If they were faithful to the Word of God on the subject of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, then they would see that it's soundly taught in Scriptures. But their bias has caused them to read those verses incorrectly. If the Pentecostal Church was operating on a consistent basis in verifiable signs and wonders, it would help silence some of those critics. Yet there are those who won't accept any evidence that the Spirit baptism is real and for today, since they refuse to believe, and unbelief is a terrible bondage. Jesus faced this exact same issue during his ministry years, as did the primitive church. So why should we think that it would be different for us today? The need around us is so great that it demands we resurrect the faith and practice of the primitive church so that we can operate in that same power today. Before this can happen, the Lord has to get a hold of some people who will live for the glory of God and not for their own glory. To live selfishly has always defined the wicked heart of mankind, and our culture thoroughly promotes our selfish bent towards evil. This is why the radical devotion of the early church needs to define the saints of today. They walked humbly before God and people, and their faith caused them to operate in the supernatural with signs and wonders following them. Persecution helped with this because it's not easy in a state of persecution to become a star before adoring crowds. A persecuted and underground church has the hope of walking in greater humility and dependence upon the Holy Spirit, which opens the floodgates of heaven to pour upon His people revival fire that's accompanied by signs and wonders. The Lord was powerfully using those primitive saints, and that's why we read in verse 43, Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. One thing I see in this verse is the integrity that defined those believers. They all had to deal with their sinful nature just like we do, and they had in their culture pitfalls and traps that they had to navigate through to walk holy before the Lord. Their holy lives and radical devotion, which was really normal devotion by God's standard, allowed them to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. The New King James Version translated this verse, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. This certainly makes it sound like this verse was referring to those days immediately following the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Commentator Adam Clark wrote that some ancient manuscripts read, And great fear and trembling came upon every soul in Jerusalem. This translation states that the people of Jerusalem were for a time in the grip of holy fear. And this is what came out of the Holy Spirit baptism that came on the day of Pentecost. They were given for a short time freedom from persecution, which helped the infant church to organize in a way that helped establish those new converts in the faith, and this would have been a huge feat. The demands upon the apostles and other prominent leaders at that time must have been intense. They would have been teaching those new converts to believe correctly about Messiah and the way of salvation. They also had to instruct those who were seeking after the truth, for the spirit of revival was in the air. During this time, the apostles were being used to perform signs and wonders through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name and authority of Jesus. Though verse 43 tells us that the apostles were being used to perform miracles, it doesn't mean that others weren't being used in this way as well. We will see this as we move along in this wonderful account of the early church. The Lord gave the apostles the gifts of miracles, healings, and other spiritual gifts that were necessary to help build the infant church. While studying the Gospel of Luke, we saw how the Lord sent out 70 disciples, giving them the same power He gave the 12 apostles, whom He sent out prior to this. 
With this in mind, it's very reasonable to believe that the Lord was doing miracles through many disciples, since it was never his plan to only let his power rest on twelve people. He wants that kind of supernatural power operating through many of his saints, both men and women. For this to happen, they must live the crucified life, so that they are dead to sin and pride. Before the Lord will entrust his power to us, we must become trustworthy. We are in desperate need of such men and women today, people whom the Lord can trust because they live holy and have the great faith necessary to see the miraculous take place. Those who claim the days of miracles ended with the death of the apostles don't have a single verse to base that claim upon. Yet people blindly believe that lie because it keeps in line with their unbelief. Nonetheless, when the Lord finds people of great faith, He will do the miraculous through them, and this is the need of the hour as we are rushing towards Christ's soon return. What are the signs and wonders the apostles performed? All of them were done through the power of the Holy Spirit, and we will see some of them in the following chapters. They would have been the same miracles the disciples performed when they were first sent out by Jesus. Before Jesus gave the seventy disciples authority to perform miracles and cast out devils, He modeled for them what He wanted them to do and preach. The Lord was preparing them for this exact time where they needed to walk by faith and not by sight or feelings. This is what the Lord wants to do today through His church, and He's doing it in various parts of the world. But we need to see more of the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit in operation in our nation. Now let's move on to verse 44. All the believers were together and had everything in common. There's a lot of abuse that comes out of this verse, so it's important that we strive to understand what's going on. When communism swept through the world after World War II, the communists used this verse in an effort to convince clergy and lay people that communism was God's desired form of government. This is an absolute lie. The brutality and butchery of communism is well documented, and it should cause us to abhor this evil, devil-inspired governmental ideology. Communism is responsible for murdering more people than any other political system ever did in the history of mankind. There are right now within our country communist communes that operate in the same way through the same spirit as communist governments. I have visited one such commune that's spreading through the farmlands of America as they buy up more and more land and use the people of those communist communes as slave labor to work the commune's lands and businesses. So what does it mean that all the believers were together and had everything in common? The idea behind this is very simple. All the believers were together and unified for the sake of expanding Christ's kingdom. This means they held to the same doctrine and were of the same heart, mind, and purpose. A large portion of them had been with Jesus to various degrees, so they knew what it was to be defined by his mission, which is to seek and to save what is lost. Jesus instilled this in the apostles who would have taught this to the saints. Their unity directly depended upon their living in unity with the Savior. During the three and a half years of Jesus' ministry, many disciples lived with him in a missionary type of society. This was on-the-job training. But he never expected all the disciples to live in such a way. Communal living wasn't a condition of true discipleship, since only a small portion of the believers were able to live in that way. The primary point that those early saints were together has to do with their unity, not that they all live together in some form of Christian commune, as some claim today. We must also understand that persecution forced the church to respond in a particular way, and it seems in this setting that many ended up in poverty because they were rejected by family and friends. This is what compelled Paul at a later date to raise an offering for the suffering saints in Israel, and especially for Jerusalem. This still doesn't mean that they all live together in communes, for the dynamics of that would have been overwhelming. The point that they had all things in common doesn't mean they supported a primitive version of communism, but that they selflessly cared for one another to such an extent that they shared in what they had. This doesn't mean that to be a Christian they had to sell everything and give it to the apostles or a particular commune. They gave as needs arose, not so they could live a communal lifestyle. It's not my purpose to say whether or not Christian communes are right or wrong. That's for individuals to decide. There are inherent problems that I have seen in all Christian communes, and the biggest being the control they have over people. If you don't have control, 
then you are sure to have rampant problems of sin and immorality. When problems break out, then communes are prone to make more rules to have greater control to avoid such problems again. At times, the control becomes so great that the commune becomes cultish in nature. This doesn't mean that they are cultish in doctrine, but socially they become cultish due to severe control over the people. One particular commune has a three-year moratorium for all new members where they can't talk to anyone of the opposite sex. Of course, they did this to stop the problem of sexual immorality, but such control over people has a whole different set of problems as came out a few decades ago through the shepherding movement. This was a movement that became extremely controlling in the name of discipleship, and here people could only marry or date if it was approved by the elders. People who have lived in communes for many years have a hard time adapting to not being in a controlled environment. Those who are kept in such an environment to help keep them from the practice of sin very often have their faith rest upon the commune and not in Christ, and this is very dangerous. There are times when communes are justifiable and even necessary, such as Christian rehabs where recovering addicts eventually become staff to help other addicts kick their addiction to come to Christ. There are still many inherent problems with this, but without believers living in such a way, it would be financially impossible for them to accomplish what they do. I have literally seen both sides of the issue of control over those who live in communes. I have seen immorality run amok when the standards are too low, and I have seen the abuse excessive control has over people and the emotional pain it inflicts. Our faith must rest in Christ alone and not in a rehab or commune, which I have seen happen many times. Because of the dangers I'm referring to, I don't think the early church developed a communal style living, except possibly in strenuous situations such as severe persecution. I know single Christians that live together, not as in a commune, but as renters who share a common living room and kitchen. Of course, they have some basic house rules that are reasonable and godly for such a situation, such as men sharing a house only with other men and women with women. I have seen this to be very beneficial because it's a godly environment that hasn't crossed a line in becoming a commune where the commune owns everything and has total control over the people. Since we each have to stand before God and give an account before Him, we must diligently seek to know His will for how we are to live in this wicked world. Now in verse 45 we are told that they sold their possessions and goods and they gave to anyone as they had need. What were these saints doing? This is a combination of discipleship and evangelism. Those who are believers strove to meet the legitimate needs of others, and according to the spiritual condition of the people, it was either discipleship or evangelism. In either case, the church was striving to show others Christ's love by caring for their material and spiritual needs. We see in this one expression of living out the second commandment, which is to love others as we want to be loved. Yet there is an even higher level of love that we are commanded to show to others, and this is obeying Christ's command to love others as He loves us, which is selflessly and sacrificially. As we continue studying the book of Acts, we will see that communal living wasn't the model the early church lived out, though some may have done that. I'm not going to take the time to document the verses in Acts that demonstrate what I'm saying, since we will eventually get to those verses as we move through this study. Notice that verse 45 doesn't say that they sold everything, though some may have done that. It merely states that they sold their possessions and goods to give to those who were in need when the need arose. Let's look at the final verses of Acts chapter 2. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily, those who were being saved. Though they more than likely didn't live in communal settings, like I'd already related, the fellowship of the saints was so important that they met every day in the temple courts and from house to house. Here again we have the twofold reason for them doing this, which was discipleship and evangelism. Though there would have been a certain amount of persecution at this time, there wasn't a widespread persecution against the saints. It wouldn't take long for this to happen, and this would certainly increase the number of believers that were forced to live in poverty for living out the true faith. When people are rejected by the people they live among, they are all the more prone to depend upon each other for what they need for social and family life. 
This is necessary for the saints to be able to stand against the rejection and loss that comes through persecution. We see from this the practical need for fellowship, where the saints help each other endure and overcome the obstacles that come through living out the faith in a hostile nation, community, or people group. There was another important reason why they fellowshiped with each other on a constant basis, and that's because they loved each other and were of one heart and mind with each other through Christ. When the saints love each other, there's nothing more beautiful and fulfilling other than our fellowship with Jesus. I have been loved by fellow believers far better than my unsaved natural family ever could. But on the flip side, when the church fails to love each other, then the abuse they can inflict on each other is terrible and extremely painful. This too I have experienced, especially as a pastor and evangelist. If we don't make ourselves vulnerable to show genuine selfless love to one another, we won't enjoy such love being shown to us. When people strive to protect themselves from being hurt, they build a cage to live within, and this makes them a prisoner to their own hurts and self-absorption. This is a miserable form of existence. Those early saints also met every day in the temple courts to spread the good news of the kingdom of God. The challenge we have with evangelism is being able to communicate with people. When people are locked in their homes, it becomes very hard to reach them. This would make public settings extremely important places to connect with people to spread the gospel. One place would be the local markets, and another, for those who lived in Jerusalem, would be in the temple courts where men and women would gather together for religious instruction. After the day of Pentecost, it seems that the temple courts were a central meeting place for Christ's followers, where they met for prayer, fellowship, and discipleship. Since there wasn't at that time a total separation between Christians and the Jewish faith, Some of the believers may have been attending the times of prayer during the morning and evening sacrifices. Yet the reference that they met in the temple courts gives the impression that they were there for the purpose of evangelism and discipleship. When Jesus taught in the temple, it was in one of the courts that surrounded the temple. We see this when he watched the people putting in their ties, which was in the woman's court. It only makes sense that the disciples followed the example that Jesus gave them in this matter. It's probably from meeting people in the temple court who had a hunger for God that opened doors to meet them in their homes for further instruction in the truths of Messiah and His work of atonement. We see from the last two verses of the second chapter of Acts that they enjoyed fellowshipping with each other, and as a result, the Lord filled them with great joy. As an evangelist, I have preached in hundreds of churches, and it doesn't take long to see if the people of a given church love each other or not. Some churches are virtually empty five minutes after the service is over. This reveals that the people don't really love each other. They are going to church out of religious duty, not out of love for Christ and each other. Then there are those churches where it's hard to get the people to leave after service is over because they love being with each other. This is extremely healthy for a church. The disciples' common love for Christ was a catalyst that fueled their love for each other. When the unsaved see how Christ's followers love each other, it will help draw them to Christ. It's obvious that those early believers loved Jesus because they demonstrated that love to one another. It was this love between the saints that caused them to sell their possessions when the need arose to meet the needs of those that they loved so dearly. It seems that the idea of verse 46 about breaking bread simply means that they often ate together for times of fellowship and discipleship. This further demonstrates the love that they had for each other and how important this fellowship was to them. The point that they gathered together to praise God doesn't mean that they had developed house churches, though they more than likely did, but that their fellowship centered around Jesus and their newfound faith. Because Christians get together doesn't mean that they are fellowshipping. For true fellowship to take place, Jesus must be central to their conversation. Fellowship doesn't happen when the only thing people talk about is business, home, children, and sports. Not that discussing such things are wrong, yet what we talk most about is a revelation about what we love the most. When Jesus is the passion of our heart and life, then He will be the primary subject we talk about. Though we may wander off to other subjects, our love for the Lord will always bring us back to talking about Him. When people are of like precious faith and love for Christ, then true fellowship happens that's rich, sweet, and edifying. The final point in Acts chapter 2 is that the Lord added daily to their number those who are being saved. This is a result of the spiritual life that those early saints lived out on a daily basis. 
They live lives that the Lord could anoint with Holy Spirit power. Jesus is the only Savior, and the Holy Spirit is the agent in convicting and drawing people to salvation. The Lord uses people to bring the message of salvation to the lost, and the quality of their life is integral to the influence they have upon the lost. Those saints were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they lived holy lives that were anointed by the Spirit, so God could do great things through them. When churches aren't seeing the lost saved, they need to take an honest look at why this is happening. When a healthy man and woman gets married, it's normal for them to have children. If they are trying to have children but can't, then there's evidence something is wrong with the husband or wife's body. When the church isn't bringing children into the fold, then there's evidence that something's wrong, and if that spiritual malady isn't fixed, then that congregation will continue to be spiritually barren. The dying churches across this country reveals that this is a huge problem. The answer isn't the church growth principles, the majority of which come out of worldly philosophies, but returning to the New Testament faith, which is God's design for the church of every era and culture. It takes some serious and painful soul-searching to honestly evaluate and diagnose the reason why a local congregation is barren. This isn't about self-condemnation, but about praying Psalms 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. We see in this heartfelt prayer not only the willingness to have the Lord search and expose our heart, but also the desire to change. May the Lord awaken the church so that the lost might be saved in great numbers, as we see in the book of Acts. Now let's move on to chapter 3 and see what Luke records next. In keeping with the ending thoughts of chapter 2, where the disciples met in the temple courts, we read in verse 1 of chapter 3, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. This gives us the context of what follows. Peter and John were getting ready to enter the temple precinct to attend a time of prayer that took place during the evening atonement sacrifice, which was for the nation of Israel. Though the priests performed sacrifice throughout the day, Every day they performed two required sacrifices for the sins of the people in the nation, and they were referred to as the morning and evening sacrifice. These were performed at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. This was the common time when people gathered to pray for the nation while the sacrifice was being offered. Though the disciples had come to understand that Jesus was their ultimate atoning sacrifice, they hadn't totally separated themselves from the Old Testament sacrificial system. I don't see any evidence in Scripture of the Jewish church performing sacrifices other than what seems to come out of the legalistic branch of the church that's referred to as Judaizers. We do find that during Paul's final trip to Jerusalem that he performed some Jewish rituals in an effort to show that he was still Jewish to appease some of his antagonists. He didn't believe there was any value in sacrificing animals since Jesus became our atoning sacrifice that was offered once for all, and he makes this point very clear in some of his writings. In verses 2 and 3, the context of what is soon to take place is further revealed. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. The first thing I want to address is where this lame man was laid each day, which is called the beautiful gate or the gate beautiful. There's no reliable way that we can know for certain what gate this was, yet there seems to be a couple of possibilities, one being the Corinthian gate. The Jewish historian Josephus gave some vague information about the gate beautiful by stating that it was on the east side of the temple looking towards the Mount of Olives. This gate was large and splendid, surpassing the other gates that led into the temple. Those were overlaid with gold and silver. The gate beautiful was said to be made of Corinthian brass, which was a very valuable metal in that day. The craftsmanship of this gate made it magnificent to behold. If this was the gate the lame man was laid at each day, it was probably the most lucrative of all the entrances into the temple because it would have drawn visiting Jews who wanted to see it. Of the man himself, we are told that he was a cripple from birth. And from Acts chapter 4, verse 22, we are informed that he was over 40 years old when he was miraculously healed. The man's age makes this miracle all the more spectacular 
and given that many people knew him, it made the miracle all the more credible. The point that he was laid each day at the gate beautiful means that some family members took him to the gate every day to beg for money to pay for his expenses. There's a good possibility that he financially did very well begging at the gate beautiful, and those who cared for him wanted all they could get out of him. By begging every day at the same gate, people would recognize him and even be driven by pity to give him a little more in alms. Yet the man's life must have been hard and filled with much pain. He probably had become a begging machine who knew how to cry after those who would give him the most. As Peter and John was getting ready to pass him by, the man began begging from them. Then in verses 4 and 5 we are told that Peter looked straight at him as did John. Then Peter said, Look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. I imagine that it was after the man began asking for money that the Lord spoke to Peter and John to have faith to see him healed. Since the apostles didn't have any money to give the man, their telling him to look at us was the first step for Peter and John to believe that the Lord was going to perform a miracle through them. The man was only asking for money, since the idea of being healed of his lifelong deformity was beyond his ability to fathom. The faith Peter and John operated in is the faith we need in the church today. This is faith to believe the promises of God, faith that pushes past doubt and fear to lay hold of God's promises. This is miracle-working faith that glorifies God, and this is what we need to confront the wicked culture in which we live, that there might be many that would come to Christ. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. Come wash in the river Come drink your fill Let healing walk